Okay, Hello. everyone. Can... Hi, Tammy. How are you? Good. Thanks, and you. Good, thank I you. think you should start. Okay, cool. So, thanks everyone for joining. Um, the talk today is about non-invasive ventilation. Okay, so what is NIV? So um, it's also referred to as NIPPV, which means non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. So it's a way of delivering positive pressure ventilatory assistance through a non-invasive rather than an invasive interface, which would be like an endotracheal tube or a tracheotomy. So, um, all right, if we just look a little bit at the history of ventilation. So in the 19th and the first half of the 20th century, um, negative pressure ventilation was predominantly used to provide ventilatory assistance. Um, so the first of these, the first one was developed in 1838. So that's um, at the top left picture. So it was one of these full body tank type of ventilators. So the patient's body was in the tank and the head was outside. And that tank was um, in a tight seal. And then a negative pressure was generated by manually pumping air into and out of the ventilator. And then there was a gauge on the outside that you could use to determine how much negative pressure were you generating. Um, the middle picture at the top, so that is actually a negative pressure operating chamber. So the patient is being ventilated with negative pressure. And then the surgeon could actually also be inside that negative pressure chamber and perform the um, operation while the patient's being ventilated. Then the next two pictures I'm sure we're all very familiar with. So the peak of negative pressure ventilation came with the polio epidemics between the 1930s and the 1960s. So this was when the first big ICUs were set up that had to care for a large number of patients at a time requiring this negative pressure ventilation. And the picture at the bottom left is showing um, a negative pressure chamber that actually could house four patients in with a single nurse then um, providing nursing care to those four patients while they were being um, uh, ventilated. So um, this was, you know, great at its time, but there were actually a lot of, pro of problems with negative pressure ventilation. So they were very big and cumbersome and they couldn't be moved around. There's very limited access to the patients. Um, there was a lot of leaking. It was difficult to avoid leaking, very difficult to achieve high ventilatory pressures where they were needed. Um, and another problem was something that's called tank shock. So this was when the negative pressure caused pooling of the blood in the lower extremities and the abdomen. So it caused a type of distributive shock in these patients. So um, yeah, there were a lot of problems. So that's why there was this movement now towards positive pressure ventilation. So the first positive pressure ventilator was actually um, in 1730. So it was just a basic bag and mask manual ventilator. Um, then that picture on the left, so that's a Draga uh, pole motor that was developed in 1911. Then the middle picture, so that's a Bird and Bennett Mark ventilator. So these are the first ventilators that were actually used for long-term um, invasive and non-invasive ventilation um, in patients. And then finally, we've moved on to devices that are similar to what we are using today. So when we're talking about any type of ventilation, so we need to have a little bit of an understanding of respiratory physiology and respiratory failure. Um, so there's two primary functions of the lungs. So the first one is to oxygenate the blood, and then the second one is to eliminate carbon dioxide. So if either one of these two functions is um, impaired, then we get respiratory failure. So we must just firstly understand that respiratory failure is not the same thing as respiratory arrest. You can be breathing and still have respiratory failure. Um, so we get two main types of respiratory failure. So the first is what is often referred to as type 1 respiratory failure. That's hypoxemic. This is when the PaO2 is less than 60 millimeters mercury. And then type 2 is hypercapnic respiratory failure. That's when the PaCO2 is greater than 50. And these two uh, values are obtained from our arterial blood gas. Um, so then there's four main groups of causes for respiratory failure, of which two are um, significant and are the common causes. So the first group, which is not um, that significant and common, so is a low inspired partial pressure of oxygen. So the inspired partial pressure is a result of the product of the barometric pressure and the uh, fraction of inspired oxygen. So an example of this would be um, a patient at high altitude where there's a low atmospheric pressure, there'll then be a low inspired partial pressure of oxygen. So this is not something that we commonly see at all, and it's not really a problem 
that we would face in the hospital because we can control the FiO2 um, for the patients. Then the second group, and this is one of the major groups, is uh, hypoventilation. So in this case, there's not actually a problem with the gaseous exchange between the alveolus and the capillary, but the actual amount of oxygen being inspired and carbon dioxide being expired is insufficient. Um, so in this case, you'll have a normal AA gradient because it's not actually a problem, as I said, with that diffusion across the membrane. Then there's a multitude of causes of hypoventilation. So we can go all the way from the brain down to the lungs. So we can have respiratory center depression, uh, depression from drugs or head injury or encephalopathy. There can be disruption of the signal transmission along the nerves in um, spinal cord injuries or Guillain-Barre syndrome or motor neuron disease. We can have problems at the neuromuscular junctions, like um, if we have neurotoxic snake bites or if we've used paralytic agents um, or in patients with myasthenia gravis. Um, you can have problems with the actual muscles like myopathies, chest wall abnormalities, and then of course we can have um, airway obstruction. So there's really many, many causes of hypoventilation. Um, and then this will usually cause um, a hypercapnic uh, respiratory failure. Then the third um, group, and this is the second big group that uh, we're very commonly seeing, is a ventilation perfusion mismatch. So there are two types of these. So the first one is um, the top picture that says dead space ventilation. So this is a situation where the alveolus is being, um, is being ventilated, but it's not being perfused. So for example, in um, a massive pulmonary embolism. The second type of the pictures at the bottom that says shunting. So this is basically the opposite. So in this case, the alveolus is being perfused, but there's a problem with the ventilation because the alveolus is either collapsed or it's filled with pus or fluid or whatever the case may be. So this would be like pneumonias or ARDS or something like that. So in this case, um, there'll be a high AA gradient because there is actually a problem with perfusion um, across the alveolar capillary membrane. And then the fourth group is a diffusion abnormality. So this is where there's a problem with the diffusion of oxygen across that alveolar capillary membrane. It is actually very common, but it's not usually significant and it's not usually the primary cause of the respiratory failure. So why is it actually important to know this? Why do we have to know what type of respiratory failure the patient has? The reason is that um, the goals of our treatment change. There's different ways to improve oxygenation versus improving um, elimination of carbon dioxide. So the ways that we can improve oxygenation is to increase the FiO2, we can increase the PEEP, and we can increase the inspiratory time. So in other words, we'll decrease the flow rate. So um, we'll be giving the patient the same amount of oxygen, but just over a longer period of time. So it causes a more even distribution of oxygen across the lungs. Um, then how can we enhance CO2 elimination? We can do this by increasing the tidal volume. Uh, we can increase the respiratory rate, and then we can also decrease dead space. Okay, so what are the indications for NIV? Why would we actually do this? So um, we are again dividing this into hypoxemic and hypercapnic causes. The um, top two in these two lists are acute pulmonary edema and an acute exacerbation of COPD. So these are in bold because these are the two conditions that are proven absolutely without a doubt to benefit um, from NIV. Then we can also use NIV for pre-oxygenation before intubating, for any of these causes of hypoventilation that we've um, mentioned. We can use it for patients post extubation and then we also can use it for obstructive sleep apnea or obesity hyperventilation. So we've all heard of OSA um, patients using CPAP at night. Then just the other causes of hypoxemic respiratory failure, so specifically pneumonia and ARDS. So these are less likely to benefit from uh, NIV. So there's quite a lot of conflicting evidence here about whether there's actually benefit or not. So the bottom line is in these patients, we can definitely do a trial of NIV for them, but we need to start NIV early and we need to have a very low threshold um, to convert to intubation for these patients. Then the contraindications. So this is essentially any condition that requires emergent intubation. Um, so inability to protect or maintain the airway, cardiac or respiratory arrest, severe acidosis, hemodynamic instability, if the patient requires high ventilatory pressures, 
if they have a non-respiratory organ failure, um, an agitated or confused patient is not going to be able to cooperate um, and with and tolerate the NIV. Um, if you have a patient with a pneumothorax, any facial trauma or recent um, upper GI surgery, and then if you have a prolonged ventilation, um, if you anticipate having a prolonged ventilation time. And then just other things to be cautious of will be patients that have excessive secretions, if they have a very weak cough, um, and if they have morbid obesity. So then what are the advantages of NIV? Why would I do this instead of just intubating the patient? So the first thing is that using NIV can actually avoid getting to the point of needing to intubate the patient in certain patients. And therefore, we can avoid the complications associated with intubation and invasive ventilation. So obviously, there's risks associated with the actual procedure of intubating. Um, we can avoid things like upper airway trauma, um, things like ventilator-associated pneumonia. We have preserved um, airway reflexes. It's very easy and quick to set up, so we don't need to have advanced airway skills in order to um, put a patient onto NIV. We don't need to sedate the patient, and then the patient maintains functions like movement, communicating, eating and drinking, etc. So these are the common interfaces that we can use for NIV. Um, so the first one is nasal pillows, that's like, just like nasal cannula, but um, they're a bit bigger, they look a little bit like earphone um, earbuds. Then we have a nasal mask, which just covers the nose, the oral oronasal mask, which is what most of us would have probably seen that covers the nose and the mouth. Then we have a full face mask, and then we have the helmet, which um, I've never seen. I don't actually know if we have them in South Africa at all. So the advantages of the nasal pillows and the nasal mask um, is, you know, that it's the, the patient won't have that feeling of claustrophobia. So this is good for patients who don't tolerate an oronasal mask. Um, the patient, again, you know, it's easy for the patient to eat and drink without having to remove that mask all the time. But the problem with this is that if the patient opens their mouth, then that potentially creates a big leak in the system. So you might need to place a chin strap for that patient to keep the mouth closed. The oronasal mask, um, this is the most commonly used interface. So it's reasonably well tolerated. Um, the face mask is actually a very good option. So it's very good at actually delivering the NIV um, and preventing leaks, but it's often poorly tolerated because of the claustrophobia. And then the helmet, in theory, and as I said, I've never seen one of these, but um, it also, you know, allows patients to drink um, through a straw, to talk. Um, the problems with this is that you actually don't know what tidal volumes you're achieving, and there can be a lot of CO2 that gets trapped in that helmet. Okay, so now I've decided to um, give my patient NIV. So what does it actually mean and what modes are we using? So essentially, you can actually use any ventilator mode um, using a non-invasive interface. So theoretically, you could give uh, volume controlled ventilation or SIMV or anything, um, but there's two commonly used modes. So these are CPAP and BPAP. And it is recommended to use an actual NIV mode when you're using it, an NIV interface, um, because these modes on the ventilator compensate to allow for some degree of leak. Um, so yeah, it is recommended to use a proper NIV mode on your ventilator. Um, so the first of these modes is CPAP. So this stands for continuous positive airway pressure. So this means that there's a single continuous level of positive pressure that's provided throughout the respiratory cycle. It doesn't change between inspiration and expiration. So essentially this is functionally similar to PEEP and therefore it's better at treating um, or at improving oxygenation than what it is at improving ventilation. So this is um, a good mode to use for patients with a hypoxemic respiratory failure, like, for example, acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Then the second commonly used mode is BPAP. So you'll often hear people talk about BiPAP when they actually mean BPAP. BiPAP is the name of a ventilator that um, is made by the company Respironics, but then you'll often hear people using BPAP or BiPAP um, interchangeably, but in any event, so what it stands for is bi-level positive airway pressure. So what happens here is that you have two different um, uh, levels of pressure being delivered. One is an inspiratory pressure and the other is an expiratory pressure. And the tidal volume that the patient is receiving correlates with the difference between this inspiratory pressure and the expiratory pressure. 
So if you remember earlier on, we said that one of the ways that we can enhance CO2 elimination for a hypercapnic respiratory failure is to increase the tidal volume. So this is a good mode to use for hypercapnic respiratory failures because we have more control over the tidal volume that's actually being delivered to the patient. So these are just some graphs um, showing a visual representation of these pressures. Um, so the top graph is just CPAP, the second graph is still CPAP, but um, that little dip is the expiratory pressure release. So it's just this split second pressure release to allow the patient to change over from inspiration to expiration. And then the third graph is BPAP. So it's showing us at the top, the inspiratory pressure level, and then lower down the expiratory pressure level. Okay, so now I've decided to put my patient on NIV. So how do I actually set this ventilator? Um, so there's really no universal settings for uh, NIV. These are just guidelines for a starting point, and then we will adjust it according to um, how the patient responds and what they tolerate. So if we're doing CPAP, so then we'll choose the mode CPAP on the ventilator. We'll put the CPAP level at uh, five to eight centimeters of water. And then as with all ventilation, we'll start with our FiO2 initially at 100%, and then we'll titrate down according to the patient's um, saturation. Uh, then if we're doing BPAP, so we can set the BPAP either as spontaneous respiration or time. So spontaneous would be when the patient is initiating the breaths. So in that case, you'll also need to set a flow trigger. Um, if you are doing spontaneous, if, if you choose spontaneous mode, then you need to set a backup rate um, of eight to 12 breaths per minute so that if it happens that the patient becomes apneic or doesn't breathe for a prolonged period of time, then the ventilator will automatically initiate a breath for the patient. Um, so again, we need to set two pressures here. So we'll set our inspiratory pressure. We'll start between eight and 12 centimeters of water. And then our expiratory pressure between three and five. And again, our FiO2 um, will start at 100% and then titrate down. Okay, so now I've started my patient on NIV. So now what happens? So we do something that's called a trial of NIV. So this happens over a one to two hour period where the patient is in a very, very closely monitored area and we're monitoring their mental status and their vital signs and their oxygenation. Um, and then we'll usually perform or do an arterial blood gas after about um, an hour to two hours. Don't put the patient on NIV and then immediately do an, a blood gas after five minutes because it's not going to be a reflection of what is actually happening to the patient. They haven't had time to adjust metabolically to what's going on. So um, once we've now doing this trial, we need to give the patient the best possible opportunity to have a successful trial of, of NIV. So we need to do some troubleshooting if there are any problems going on. So the first thing and a major problem um, is patient ventilator dyssynchrony that we need to try and correct. So this dyssynchrony is when the phases of the ventilator breath does not match the phases of the patient's breath. So for example, if the patient's tachypneic um, and their respirator is 30 and I've put them on BPAP on a preset time mode of 10 breaths per minute, then those phases are not going to the, are not going to match up with the patient who's trying to breathe at a rate of 30. So the patient's going to be breathing against the ventilator. Um, the second thing is to try and treat auto peep if it's present. So auto peep happens when there's usually something that happens in patients with obstructive airway disease like asthma or COPD. We know that these patients um, have a longer or need a longer period to um, exhale. So if we initiate the next breath before the patient has finished exhaling, then there will be gas trapping and we um, create auto peep. So the way that we can treat this is to either decrease the respiratory rate, we can increase the inspiratory flow rate, and then we can treat any underlying air, um, airflow obstruction with uh, beta agonists. Um, then we need to try and reduce any interface leak. So if there is a big leak, then that can increase the amount of time that it takes to reach the pressure target. Um, and then it will again create that dyssynchrony. It'll be very uncomfortable for the patient. And then the last thing is to try and reduce patient anxiety. Um, so we can allow the patient to hold the mask against their own face initially, start on lower settings, and then titrate it up as the patient tolerates. And we can use the most comfortable interface for the patient.
and we must just have a little bit of compassion for what we're actually doing to our patients here um so if you actually go and put the mask on your own face and start it on NIV. They did this when we did the basic course. It is extremely uncomfortable. It's very suffocating and claustrophobic, and it's very, very difficult to try and breathe out against those positive pressures. So um, it's not easy for, for the patients to be started on this. So we can start at lower settings, and then as they become used to it and tolerate, we can slowly increase those settings to higher pressures. So now we've done our trial. So the trial will either be successful. So um, it'll be successful if there's both clinical and gas exchange, uh, if there's improvement in both clinical and gas exchange criteria, or we can have trial failure. So there's actually quite high failure rates of um, NIV. There's two studies that we mentioned on UpToDate that found there's up to 50% um, of patients who undergo NIV actually fail the trial. Um, so the trial would fail if there's worsening gas exchange, um, if there's any clinical deterioration, so if there's increased respiratory rate, um, worsening mental status, or any hemodynamic instability. So this relies quite heavily on our clinical judgment. Um, and of course, in this case, we're certainly not going to wait until the two hours has passed before we decide, okay, they failed the trial, let's intubate them. Um, if at any stage during this trial, the patient starts to deteriorate, then we'll immediately stop them on NIV and intubate them. Um, then just one other thing to mention during the NIV trial is to try and do all other possible medical optimization at the same time. So, for example, if the cause of respiratory failure is pulmonary edema, then during this trial of NIV, we can also diurese the patient, or we can also try and treat the airway obstruction if it's a COPD patient, for example, again, to try and give them the best chance of a successful NIV trial. Then just some other um, supportive me measures that we can implement. So um, the positioning of the patient should be upright or semi-upright. We can do NIV um, in a, a patient who's supine or Trendelenburg for short periods of time if we're doing a procedure. So for example, if we're inserting a central line, but then once we finish with the procedure, then we'll return them to the upright position. Um, we can give analgesia and then sedation we need to be a bit careful with. So on the one hand, we don't want to sedate them so much that we decrease their respiratory drive, but having a light level of sedation can help with the patient's tolerance of the NIV. Um, then feeding, we prefer enteral feeding versus perenteral feeding. Um, it can be a bit of a challenge in patients using, for example, orofacial masks or full face masks, because then the the whole NIV interface will have to be removed while the patient's eating and drinking and then replaced. And then we're going to be losing all of that PEEP and recruitment, something that we've achieved. But I mean, the patient has to eat at the end of the day. Um, then we'll do routine suctioning. Um, we can do nebulizing. So this can be either inline nebs or we can remove the NIV mask, do standard nebulization and then replace the NIV mask once we're done. And then just general ventilator circuit maintenance, things like changing the filters, etc. So the complications of NIV are very few. Um, it's generally very safe. Most of the complications are local and it's related to pressure and tight fitting mask. So we can have local skin damage. This would usually be over the bridge of the um, nose from the mask. We can have eye irritation, sinus pain on congestion. Um, it can cause epistaxis, although we try to avoid the um, drying out of the mucous membranes because with NIV you're receiving humidified oxygen. And then you can have mild gastric distension, but this is usually not that significant. Um, and it's not recommended to routinely insert a nasogastric tube for these patients. And the other problem is that a nasogastric tube is going to interfere with the fit of your interface. Um, and then just to remember, we can get other complications. So if, for example, we inadvertently started NIV on a trauma patient with an undiagnosed pneumothorax, then we can um, end up with a tension pneumothorax. Then I just have one line here on um, COVID. So the reason I put the slide in is just because during COVID is really when a lot of us sort of became more aware of and actually started using NIV for the first time. Um, because there were just so many masses of patients, we didn't have the resources. So it's not that different um, from non-COVID patients receiving NIV. So we can consider this in acute hypoxemic respiratory failure patients with oxygen requirements greater than what low flow devices can provide. 
Um, for COVID, we can use either high flow nasal cannula or we can use the NIV, which I've been talking about. If you have a patient that has an underlying condition that is known to respond well to NIV, like pulmonary edema or COPD, then we'd obviously choose to go for NIV. But if not, then you can use either one. There's no um, real difference. For the interface, we'd choose an oronasal mask or a full face mask. This is mostly just for the droplet precautions. Um, we'll do a trial of NIV, the same as what I've um, already been through. There's no set duration for the NIV. But in these cases, we'll have a very low threshold for intubation. So as I said earlier, with pneumonia and ARDS and that, um, there's conflicting ev evidence about how much benefit they can actually get from NIV. Um, so we must have a low threshold for intubating these patients. And we certainly don't want to wait until the patient is in extremis before we make that decision to change over to intubation. And then just about proning. So it has been recommended to prone the patients for six to eight hours at least per 24-hour period. Although I did see that um, now there were two studies mentioned, I think in July, observational studies that were actually finding that there were no, not any significant difference in intubation rates between patients that had been proned and those who hadn't. So I guess we'll wait on more information about that. So then this is just a little cheat sheet, I suppose, for um, starting NIV if it if you actually have to start it on the patient. Um, so we'll place the patient in a monitored area. Remember the patient is in charge, it's very uncomfortable. So we need to you know, allow the patient to slowly get you to the NIV. First, put the mask only on the um, patient's face and allow the patient to hold the mask against their face before you put those tight straps on. Start even with pressures of zero with an FO2 of 100% and then slowly go up by pressures of one or two centimeter of water intervals. Um, slowly increase it as the patient tolerates it. And then just remember all of the other supportive measures that we can use. Okay, so then just in summary, um, so NIV is very individualized approach. There's absolutely no um, universal rules or, or settings or anything. It's really individualized per patient. It can, in certain patients, avoid, intubate, avoid intubation, but do not delay intubation. Do not wait until the patient is in extremis. If the patient is failing in NIV, then immediately convert to intubation. The patient needs to be carefully monitored. And then again, there's absolutely no um, like 100% right or wrong. And if you stuck, call a friend. Okay, and then those are my references. And yeah, if anyone has any questions or comments or anything. Thank you, Amy. That was awesome. <laughs> um, I'm going to also say, Please, if you guys have got any questions or comments, now is your time. <laughs> I do have um, quite a nice little YouTube um, video that I'll post on the academic group um, after this. It's just uh, shows the actual ventilator screen and how to set it up and, and all of that. I just couldn't find any nice short clips to put in the actual talk. Cool. Okay. So what I'm going to ask is, can you go back to the interfaces picture? There we go. Okay. So the nasal pillows is essentially very similar to a uh, high flow nasal. Yeah. Except that we are connecting it to a ventilator. Which kind of patient, and it doesn't have to be Amy that answers this, which kind of patient are we using nasal CPAP for? Nasal NIV, usually. So we're normally using that actually in neonates. Yeah, a little neonate. So it's it's widely used. Mums can continue to feed. We can continue to feed. The little one might be on the mum for a bit. Often, usually they're in an incubator, but they can be cleaned and bathed and changed while they're still on the CPAP. Um, the helmet. What um, what patient category is this usually? Um, age group. I suppose this would probably be older the patients. Smallies. Oh, no, okay. interestingly, it was also, uh, I've also only seen it in pictures, um, but in kids, so neonates as well, um, uh, similar in a way to nasal CPAP. It's sort of difficult to have a true reflection of flows 
um, and tidal volumes, especially if the mouth is open, um, much the same as sort of having feedback in the helmet is difficult. Can I ask you to go to the page on contraindications? There we go. All right, and I'm going to ask, I think Monique is on the call. Um, so Monique, and um, yeah, okay, and I'm asking you, because I, th I think you guys have done it quite a lot at Helen Joseph. Tell me what you think about that contraindication there, agitated or confused patient. Hello, everyone. Hi. Hey. <laughs> yeah, um, with the agitated and confused patients, it's a serious um, contraindication, but I'm glad Amy mentioned later on in her talk that we do give them a bit of a light um, sedation. Analgesia. We're going, to, we're going to stop you there. We're going to analgese them and maybe anxiolize them. We're not going to sedate them, right? Okay. Yeah. But tell me, have you ever put a patient on NIV that is agitated or confused? I've tried, um, but I have been very unsuccessful. <laughs> okay. All right. So no, I have, thank I'm you. being honest, I have tried. Yeah. But thank it, you for it sharing. Works. <laughs> That's okay. I think I'd all say right. more that I've we've put on anxious patients because they're anxious obviously we because they yeah. can't breathe. Yeah. Not, not necessarily yeah. a confused patient, but we have put on anxious okay. patients and then Okay. Obviously, after a while, they improve <laughs> because okay. they can breathe better. So, so I agree with you. It's really difficult, right? Exactly what um, Monique was saying. It's very difficult when they're confused and agitated and thrashing around because they want to throw it off their face, right? What happens if it is because they're hypoxemic or their CO2 is high? That is why they are confused. Yeah. NIV has the potential to improve those things. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's a relative contraindication. Also, um, can I ask you to go to your indications page? Okay, all right. So we very well might use NIV as a non-invasive mode of ventilation. So it might either be a step up or a step down mode of ventilation. But we also might use it for a specific reason, and that is to... Um, oxygenate a patient, so maximal pre-intubation oxygenation and denitrogenation. So we might use it to optimize a patient before we intubate them. So in those patients, they might be confused, um, they might be a bit agitated, but we're doing a procedure to optimize their oxygenation and their ventilation prior to intubation. So it might be a step two intubation, and then we might do procedural sedation and analgesia, which we, we would tend to kind of go for anxiolysis in a, in a typical patient. But let's say somebody is wildly confused because they've got pneumonia. We also might then try to do a procedural sedation and analgesia with a delayed sequence intubation, for example, with ketamine and optimize their ventilation with NIV for 20 to 30 minutes and see if there's a good improvement before we plan to intubate them anyway. It's not necessarily a trial of NIV. We very well might be using NIV to optimize them before we do this planned intubation. So that's one sort of interesting thing. Can I ask you to go to your page on troubleshooting? Um, where was I? Um, I just have to find it quickly. <laughs> Oh, there we go. That way, there we go. So I 100% agree with you that all of these points are first. But um, I'm going to ask um, Monique again because you've done this a lot in the ED. Which would you say are the one? Which order would you say it is the most important when doing a trial of NIV? Which are the ones that we'll start with wanting to do first? So it says here: correct asynchrony, treat auto peep then interface leak, then patient anxiety. Which order do you think we probably need to do it in, in the ED? Okay, I would probably start with making the patient um, less anxious because mm -hmm. then you can, in doing so, you can reduce the interface leak. Yes. Um, you will then be able to see what, if um, 
what the auto peep is and if it's causing mm. issues and correct that and then move on to see if there's any dyssynchrony. Mm. So, I, so I would probably do it in the exact opposite order. So patient anxiety, the biggest problem with NIV is interface leak. It always leaks, right? Especially when patients are wriggling around. Then when everything is settled, we can have a look and see what's going on with the tidal volumes um, and see how they are tolerating the NIV. Um, so probably with a reversed order. But to be honest, we do all of this simultaneously, right? It's not step one, step two, step three. Okay. Can I ask a question? And it was stuff that Amy was talking about. Um, and I think that uh, Christelle is on the call. What are the risks of NIV, specifically with a really sick patient? What, what are some of the risks with regard to, to NIV? Especially if you've got a patient who you think is pretty sick and very well might need to be intubated. Stel, Crystal? Okay, I'm gonna ask Amy, can you answer the question? Um, so I think, um... Tammy, apart from the sort of mild things that I had spoken about, um, I think probably one of the risks is that as soon as you, if you're waiting until the patient is, you know, sort of in extremis, then as soon as you remove that NIV, then they're going to really crash. And you're going to actually have a hard time intubating and yeah. ventilating them. So some studies have shown that NIV can delay life-saving intubation, and obviously then subsequent ventilation. So we have to pick our patients very carefully, exactly all the points that you've been making. Um, because if we actually have a patient who's got an indication for intubation and ventilation, rather not even do a trial of NIV. Trial of NIV is very good for specific conditions like COPD, maybe uh, acute decompensated pulmonary edema while we're optimizing medications. Um, I would like to ask one last question. Tell us about the basic course. Um, <laughs> okay, so I was on the waiting list for a very long time. Um, mm -hmm. It was really good course. The, um, the main things that are really gained out of the course was related to ventilation and NIV and uh, blood gases. So there's quite a lot of other topics that are covered, but, you know, like the trauma mm -hmm. part, you know, you should rather just do ATLS but about the ventilation it was really really excellent um awesome there's some thank brilliant you. minds there <laughs> that you could really and have a lot you, to Amy. learn from and I want to say thank you very much for tackling this topic we 